that good. First Corinthians 9 is where I'm going to be going this morning if you want to turn with me in your scriptures here today. It's that time of year whenever we see the Olympics roll around and it reminds us of how, just how out of shape we all are. How many of you see all that on there and you're like, wow, that's wow, uh, something else. There's a young woman, I'm going to butcher these names, uh, these, that's taken the internet by storm, Olana Meyer, Mayer, uh, one of the two, if you'll go ahead and put that picture up there real quickly for me. And um, she uh, is in women's rugby, um, and uh, she, she, she plays, um, um, uh, she, wow, I, I don't, that is just one freight train coming right at you. I watched some of what she did, and she, she hurts some people uh, whenever she does that. She's got a stiff arm. She took one. I don't know what, well, who she was playing. She just grabbed him by the shoulder and just threw him down. And, like, they were a rag doll. She, she is uh, just, but, uh, just, just sweet, sweet young woman with that. But, um, I mean, and they took bronze. That, by the way, the rug for the first time ever in the history of the United States that we medaled in that particular uh, category. Katie uh, Ledecky. I believe is the way you say that. She is a swimmer, and uh, and just uh, I think she just got another medal in a fifteen hundred. Uh, powerful young woman. You wouldn't know that she has Potts disease, uh, and she it, it's it's very very painful. And even through all of that, is able to be a world-class swimmer. Um, when I wrote this, she had a gold, silver, and bronze. I think it's two gold, silver, and a bronze now uh, that she has so far. And then the men's gymnastics broke a 16-year medal drought. They took bronze, uh, but they hadn't had a medal in 16 years. And there was a guy by the name of Stephen uh, Nodorosik. Um, if you hear this, Stephen, I apologize. Uh, with that on the pommel horse. Yeah, that's him there. Um, whoa. Uh, that, you know, powerful, powerful guy. You wouldn't know that he's, I don't know if he's legally blind, but he has a, he, he wears thick glasses because he's cross-eyed. Uh, and he also has a degenerative eye disorder with tissues missing out of his eyes. And so for him, that's, that, you, you got to be up there. You got to, how many of you know, you can get disoriented very quickly if you don't have correct vision. And yet he's able to overcome that, and he and he they just brought him in to do that. That's that's the only reason that guy was even there was just to do that one thing. He does it so well, and uh, and to be able to do that. So the, all of these stories that I hear coming out, and the people overcoming, and the people winning, and and all the things that are happening and taking place, it, it really is very inspirational. And, and so that you know that whenever we read in the New Testament and we talk about sports, or you talk about races, you talk about all these different things, the Olympics existed in the time of Christ. And so the, the Olympics was a thing. Uh, even then, uh, it would be played in Rome, uh, in Greece, I should say, and uh, uh, every four years, just like they do it now. If I was to ask you what was a goal of being in the Olympics, it would be to win the gold. Yeah, everybody wants to win the gold. But how do you determine who deserves it? Well, you've got to keep score. Somebody has to keep score, right? In order to know who's in first and second and third and who's winning and who's losing. But can you imagine being a part of a sport where everybody did their thing, but nobody kept score? Nobody knew what was going on, what was taking place, or going to work, and they and they didn't uh, they didn't keep your hours correct. You know, there's this. Oh, you came to work? Well, okay. You know, um, here here you go. Um, we we think this is what you deserve. You know, whatever. Um, you know, oh, you went out and played? Well, here's your trophy. Here, you go for it. Doesn't seem to make much sense. And the question becomes: How do you measure? How do you know that you're living your life for Christ? How do you keep score to know that you are living your life for Christ? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you realize that every race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do it whatever it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. 
boy, Paul packed a lot into just this, those verses, and I'm going to be able to hit a few highlights here this morning to be able to do that. But he understood that there's a goal. He understood that there is training. He understood there is a purpose to doing everything that he was doing for Christ and in his own personal walk with God. Now, he understood the Olympics. The Olympics were a little bit different than they are right now. First of all, at that time, all athletes competed naked. Not an amen, nothing. You know, you're just looking at me and going, what? Ever? Yeah. So um, corporal punishment awaited those guilty of a false start on the track line. <laughs> so if you, if you did a false start, you got a beating uh, for, for doing that. I bet you that messed a few people up. There were no points, no time limits, and no weight classifications in boxing. So just, you know, you got who you got. Yeah, well. Athletes in combat score, sports had to indicate their surrender by raising their index finger. At times, they died before they could do this. They took such a beating, they couldn't. And Well, anyhow, so... Yeah, Olympics then, Olympic Sal, not the same thing, but, but he understood running the race. And I thank, the, I thank the Holy Spirit for making sure he focused on that because we all understand running the race. Some of you are in track and field whenever you were in high school, uh, or some of you just ran from your parents. Uh, or, you know, there, there are lots of different reasons why everybody knew, you know, you had to have a good pair of shoes to be able to do this. Verse 24, so run to win winners earn their place. Winners earn their place. They do. That's a truth. We all know that. We know somebody wins, somebody loses. They earn their place. Look at every person's life of faith in the Old and even in the New Testament. Look at everybody in there. They earn their place of faith. If you read Hebrews 11, there's a whole list of them in there. And if you look at all their backstories, you're like, wow, wow. You know, they really, really <laughs> suffered. They really struggled. They really had to overcome. They really had to have a lot of faith in order to do that. I'm reminded of that Paul in Acts chapter number 14. He's preaching to a crowd. Some of his enemies were there. They got angry with him. They drug him out of town and tried to stone him to death. When he came to later, it says he got up and he went back into town. <laughs> They, uh, uh, they, that's like, whoa, that's something else. He went up and went back into town. So whenever he says in 2 Timothy, chapter, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. He knows what he's talking about. And I'll share with you why, because when we see Corinthians written and when we see 2 Timothy written, that's a long time of there, there, there's a significant amount of time between those two scriptures. So whenever, whenever we see him writing this, he understands the price that he has paid in order to live the life that God has called him to live. He understands what he had to do in order to be a follower of Jesus. And I think for many people here today, sometimes we, we just, um, and I said this in, in during worship, is that some people earn their faith and some people just wing it. You know, we're just, you know, trying to go, well, you know, I'm going to go to do the church. There's a lot of people doing the church thing this morning. I'm not saying necessarily anybody in here, but you know people, oh, I went to church yesterday, and they think they, you know, they get a gold star in, uh, uh, for, you know, they think they've, they're, you know, they get a medal and everything, and it's like, yeah, you're not quite getting this. They will say that's good enough. That's good enough. You know, my giving, that's good enough. Or my, my service to others, is that's good enough. Or my, my attitude towards worship, that's, that's good enough. I, I, I sang, I clapped in the song, you know, that's good enough. I sang off key, that's good enough. And those things are great. But I have discovered that faith will, if faith will strive to be just 1% better than where you are at right now, just 1%. If you'll push yourself to be just a little bit better today and you'll do it again tomorrow, if you'll just do that little bit every day, you can revolutionize, you can change your life, you can change your future, you can change your family tree, you can change everything in your life just by doing that little bit every day. 
It's a lot like training. You're going in and you start out in the gym and you look around and you're going, you're definitely not winning. Okay, you know, you compare yourself to everybody else around you and you go, I think I'll go home now and, and eat, eat some Hot Pockets. The, uh, um, the, but, but the reality is if you just keep trying and you keep working and you keep striving and you stay in it day after day after day, it pays off. Not only for what you do physically and mentally, but what you do spiritually because God created us in body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Now, two people. I need a couple of people. Eric, come here. Help me out here just a second. Andrew, come here. Now, they're big guys, okay? So, but they're not going to hurt each other, so they're safe, okay? So I'll be able to get there. And my camera people need to be on point right now. So, uh, so come in here. So I just want you two to face each other and to take the opposite hand. I want you to thumb wrestle. Okay, here we go. Now, hang on, hang on. I'll call it here just a second uh, to be able to, live, be able to do this. So how many, how many of you know how to thumb wrestle? Yeah, okay, I'll live, be, able, be able to do that. You know what this is. So it's gonna be, uh, how does this go? Um, I, one, two, three, four, I declare thumb wars, and then go for it. There you go, and, and to see who, who be able to do this. Uh, one, oh. Got to get to the count of three. What? One, one, two, three. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. You can be seated. Oh, oh, hold it. Hand me this right here, if you would. Give me, give me that thing right there. You're, you're the, yeah, there we go. We've got, we got, here we go. You're a winner. All right, congratulations. Here we go. We got this for you. Everybody give them a great big round of applause. Is this my loser trophy? That, that it, no, you won. You, you won. You have to be able to do that. Go. Um, hold it. Did you win? You won? Give me, give me that back. Go away. All right. You, you lose. Come back up here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. No, I screwed up. And this is like Steve Harvey getting the wrong name at the, uh, uh, at, at, at to be able to do that. There you go. That, that's my... Now, you can go give it to him if you want to. You can go do that. That would be right. They're, they were, their hands are twisted. I really did think he won. But, uh, but uh, he's looking at me going, oh, this is a loser's trophy. I went, huh? Uh, there was, you know. Anyway. So what is our prize as followers of Jesus? What is our prize? What's the, what do we collect? What do we get? What do we, what do we earn to be able to do this? Most of you say heaven, right? Yeah. I'm going to go to heaven. Yay. You're partially correct. Here's a little bit. You got, that's part of it. Yes, that is. But have, heaven for us isn't the whole prize. A changed life. That's the prize. A life that has been changed from sinner to saint. There's one. A life changed from addict to sober. A life changed from, from depressed to joy. A life that's changed from poor to rich. And that's not just finances, by the way. That's just one of many areas. A, 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 from and to. There, God has a purpose for your life. If you don't know what that is, you're not living in it. And you want to know how to be able to do that. If the Holy Spirit isn't changing your mind, if the Holy Spirit isn't changing your heart and your soul, you're losing you're falling behind. And you want to live to be more like Jesus. Amen. Back in the 80s, we had the, what, the w, 90s, the WWJD. What would Jesus do? And it got wore out, I get that, and everybody kind of rolls their eyes whenever they hear it, but it's still true. When you go to work tomorrow, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus say that? How would Jesus do this? How would Jesus serve? How would Jesus do the things that you do? And I know some of you, and inevitably, some of you are facing some tough stuff this week. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do if he was in my shoes? And once you've got an answer, do that. If you don't know what to do, just do what God would do, what Christ would do if he was living your life. And that's whenever we begin to change, because in and of yourself, you would probably not do that. Hello? How many of you got, no, you got a dark side? 
How many of you know you got to, you know, you know and, and you work very hard to keep that thing where it's supposed to be. And that's called a struggle of spirit and the flesh, and it's talked about in Galatians, and, and Paul acknowledges it. The Bible acknowledges that we do have that struggle, but the Bible also acknowledges the fact we win. We can win because we are empowered by the blood and the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, the power of prayer, the power of worship. All of these things are to empower us to overcome those things that try to destroy us. Satan knows that you're a contender for the gold. He knows that you're not in the back of the pack. He knows that you can win and you can win big. It doesn't matter who you are. I don't care who's listening to me here online. I'm talking to everybody in the house. That you are able to win. He knows you can win. He knows you can overcome challenges. He knows you can overcome selfishness and pride. He knows that and he would prefer you spent your time fighting against the culture and fighting against this and and that and authority and all of these things and and, and fighting against the church and and having come up with all these fantastic and all the rest of the stuff. He would rather you be distracted is the word there from being in your training to win in the gold in your life with Christ. This is what Paul called the good fight of faith. That's what he was calling the good fight of faith. That you would be a winner over the things that would try to steal your soul. We're all involved in, 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 a, heat, in a heated competition for our hearts. There's something always, there's always going to be something. There's always going to be something. And I'll be transparent here in the first part of worship this morning, and these guys are doing great up here, and the Holy Spirit was moving, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there. I just wasn't there. I, I was talking, I kept talking to Betty, uh, my wife. We're just going back and forth there, talking to her. I'm like, I'm not here. I'm not, um, this is not... Uh, um, you know, the, the engine's misfiring. Uh, something ain't happening. I'm just, man, I was struggling and struggling and struggling. When I stood up here, though, and things begin to change. Why? Because I took a step of faith to walk from here to here. That's all it was. That's all I needed to do. Everything changed immediately. And for many of you, that's all you need to do is take a step of faith. That's it. I know this does, that sounds, that sounds simple. I think that God would love for everyone on this earth to understand his message so so simply, with with such ease that everybody gets it. He wants you to understand him, and so he doesn't overcomplicate himself in his relationship with you. You may not feel like you're a contender, but I have good news for you. You're still in a race. How do you know I'm still in a race? Take a deep breath. You're still in a race. You're still breathing, okay? You're still here. You're still going. Philippians 3.14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize which, for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. So um, if I could have you go ahead and hand those out, if you would, Greg, at this time, as, and, and everybody's going here going to get a medal, and don't argue with them about it. But uh, as they hand all of those out, bring me one, if you would, please. I don't care whichever one you got. Uh, be able to do that with. Be a good idea if I had one. Cool. And so we have, you know, every, everybody here is going to get a medal. And if you're online, I didn't get my medal. Well, register and tell me you want one. I'll mail it to you. But anyhow, God wants you to be free from the penalty of sin. He wants you to be free from the penalty of sin. Think of it this way. You got got these guys out here, and I was watching some of track and field, and I'm really particularly invested in the women's track and field because some of those runners in the relay races are from uh, Arkansas, from my home state. And so I'm watching them out there. They're running, and they're fast. Ooh, man, they are fast. And, And so... Um, I'm, you know, I'm watching them out there and, and, they're, and they're putting everything in it. And I was sitting there thinking, if you just put a five pound weight on them, just five pounds, what difference would that make? They wouldn't be as fast, would they? If you put 10 pounds on, what would happen? Ooh, things would change drastically. And 10 pounds is not a lot, is it? No, it isn't. 
It really isn't until you try to lose it. Mm, that's a different story. But nonetheless, you, 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 you just, just to be able to... And so the Lord wants you to win at the race, and he wants your life to be transformed to be more like Jesus every day. He wants you to be able to say, I won. Now, some of you in here, you're going, but I didn't get a gold medal. And you're already looking at me with disappointment. So uh, you can get... Uh, let me, hear, let me tell you, gold is, is blessed, a- amen? Silver is blessed, amen? Bronze is blessed, amen? Why? Because you cross the finish line. You cross the finish line. It's not about being better than everybody else. You need to, you need to kind of stop, get, you know, knock it off. Whenever you compare your faith with someone else's faith, you're always going to end up on the losing end of your own argument because you never pick anybody who's worse off than you because, well, that was rude, you know. We're always looking at somebody else who has more faith, we say. They have, they're, they're more righteous. They're, 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 they worship better. They, they, they teach better. They, we always look and we compare ourselves to somebody around us, and comparison is fatal. Somebody say amen. When we compare ourselves... Our faith, our lives, our marriages, our futures to somebody else, it's always going to be fatal. And that kind of, I'll be honest with you, just leaves you depressed. You don't even want to run the race anymore. What's the point? They're going to beat me. But God's trying to tell you, don't worry about them. They're just trying to get across the finish line. Now you do the same thing. It doesn't matter if you come in first, second, or third. You're still living under the blessings of God's word and of his promises in your life every day. Refuse to settle for less than God's best in your life. Refuse to live. Refuse to settle. We think, well, my faith is good enough. Ah, Take it. Keep moving. It may be good enough today. But that's not going to be good enough tomorrow. His mercies are new every day, the scripture tells us. You need new mercy every day. You're going to need new faith every day. Well, pastor, I'm using all the faith I got and I ain't got none left. Well, then let's just take a quick trip over to 1 Corinthians 12 where it talks about the gift of faith that God will give you. And if you need your your faith turbocharged, basically that's what it means, you have supernatural faith at your disposal if you need more. And what did, what did Jesus commend the, the disciples for whenever they said, increase our faith? He said, you, you prayed for a good thing. You prayed for a great thing. Amen. Oh, Lord, I don't have enough faith. No, switch that around. Lord, I don't have enough faith, and I need more. Help, help me. You are my source of faith. I'm not my source of faith. You're not, and none of us, you, God is your source. And turn to him when you need him at all times. Winners are always in training. How many push-ups do any of you think you can do? Andrew, how many push-ups? What do you think? I'm not going to make you do it. 25, 30. Eric, what do you think? No. Uh, Tommy. How much you eat? It depends on how much you eat before. So if you don't eat, you do 15 maybe. All right. So according to the U.S. military, below average is 55, anything less than 55. Average is 55 to 74. Good is 75 to 99. Excellent is 100 to 110. And extraordinary is 111 or more. An Olympian gymnast or wrestler will range between one to 300 a day. A day. I'm, I'm in pain thinking about it. I, I would be like, next, if I did 100 next morning, you'd have to come in and there'd be physical therapy and, and paramedics and stuff. They, uh, it, w- it would be ugly uh, for, for something like that to happen. These Olympians know that there's a day when they will no longer be able to do this again. They understand that they are working on a timeline. If they're going to be at their peak performance for the Olympic Games, everything leads to that point. And then they have to answer the question, do I quit? Do I keep going another four years? 
And we've seen them. We've seen them go, 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 and then they say, I'm retired. That's it. I'm done. I'm at the top of my game, and I'm not going to mess with this anymore. And you say, well, why do they quit? Why don't they keep going? Because the price tag is no longer worth it. But you see, for us and our faith, this is the amazing thing. We never stop. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter our age. It doesn't matter what our status in life is. It doesn't matter if we've known Jesus five minutes or for 50 years. We always grow. And one of the most exhilarating aspects of the Christian life is that regardless, there's always room to grow. There's always room to grow. You think, well, pastor, I finally made it. No, you haven't finally made it. Not not even close. There's room to grow. We keep going to run the race in such a way in order to be able to win the prize. And the ultimate prize is eternal life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, forever and forever. In verse 25, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do so to win a prize that will fade away. In those days, they got a wreath on their head which in a few days would be gone. But we do it for an eternal prize. Why do you run your race of life? Tomorrow you're going to get up and you're, you're going to you think, well, I'm a rat. I'm in a rat race. I hope not. I, when, that just You're not a rat, okay? But w- whenever we get up, why do we do it? Some people live their life for me, myself, and I. Those three people right there. They just live everything for those three right there. They, they just, it, everything is about them. It's all about me. Some people live their lives for their, the rewards of money and popularity and power and accolades and all of their legacy and all the rest of the stuff that you hear them. And then we live our lives for eternal purposes. And it isn't just so I will spend eternity in heaven but it is also your purpose to make sure everybody else in here spends eternity in heaven too. And the people that you're going to meet this week have an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior, to be able to speak wisdom into people's lives that the Holy Spirit gives to you in order to see lives changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You want to hear the words from Matthew 25, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all that matters. When you stand before God, men do not judge you. There is no jury of your peers in heaven. It's you. It's God. And that's the only thing that matters in that moment is what he says. And what you want to hear is good and faithful. You say, well, pastor, I'm kind of good and mostly faithful. Keep working on it. You're going to get there. Stay faithful. In verse 26, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. This is why we offer hope groups. This is why we offer opportunities for you to be able to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ because it's your best and greatest opportunity to grow in your faith. And a lot of people say, well, I can do that privately. I can do this on my own. And as a, a, a pastor and as a one who has trained teachers for decades and one who has, has been and teaching people to grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ for decades, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You just can't get any old study Bible and read it and think that's going to be good enough. You need other people in your life. Now, first of all, the Bible says don't be a Lone Ranger Christian. Second of all, it says you're part of the family of God, so you ought to come to the family reunions on Sunday. Um, He says you ought to hang out. You ought to hang out with people of like-minded faith. It says that in Scripture. And then he gives this whole list of people that we find in the Bible in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 6, all the way through there, people who are gifted and equipped by the Holy Spirit to invest into your life the Word of God and the truth of God's Word that it will change you to be more like Jesus. But I find it's very interesting that we never change and grow if we don't listen. You say, well, why, when, when do we just, you got you to gotta be a part. You got to show up. So when we talk about hope groups and you're like, pastor, why are, you, why, are you, why are you doubling hope groups? Why are you doing all this? Because we're leaning in hard to lead people into a new level of faith in Jesus Christ. That's you. We're challenging every one of you to do something. And there's plenty to offer from one end of the spectrum all the way to the other. 
And I'm believing that God is going to bless this church, but he's most off, you're going you're gonna to grow in your relationship with Jesus so that four or five months from now, you're going to look back on this day and go, I am not the same person that I was on August 4th, 2024. God has done this. God has done that. I thank God for this. I thank God for that. You don't want to get five or six months from now and look back on today and say, nothing happened. Nothing changed. Well, this church doesn't do anything. What? It's your own fault. You choose to grow. How many of you know if you're going to lose 10 pounds, I'm not going to do it for you? How many of you know that if you're going to, uh, uh, if you're going to get a promotion at your job, Greg ain't doing it for you? You do it. You step up and say, I've been created by the creator to serve a purpose in his kingdom so that people will know and he will be glorified all over the world that Jesus Christ is Lord over all. And that, oh, that reminds me, next week's message, and God just dropped it in my heart this morning, is, is really going to be addressed on how we help raise that next generation. And it's important. It's a, it's a, it, it is really, and it's something that I saw this week that was deeply disturbing to me, a lie that's being told to our children and to our teens and young adults. Now, what does God say about that? So I'll keep going, and then, but that's next week. Now, mm, uh, you can achieve more together. If you want to change and be more like Jesus, hang around people who are changing and becoming more like Jesus. Because, believe me, it, there's nothing makes Satan happier than for you to be isolated and alone. He can defeat you just like that. So look around everybody around you in here and say, I need you. I need you. I'm going to, you might want to say which class you're going to or teaching, whatever, be a part of it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, and especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I want, I want you to imagine living your life in front of a huge stadium. A huge stadium, and we've got big stadiums here in the United States. The biggest one I ever saw was actually in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and we went by this stadium, and I made them stop the car. What is that? Well, that's a stadium where we play we soccer, football, soccer. You know? And I'm like, how many does that seat? And they said 150,000. And during season, it's full. I'm like, That's big. We don't have anything like that around here. And, and so I want you to imagine that stadium. 150,000 people and they're watching you live your life. That's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get through to you. He says, imagine everybody, all the believers and all the people of faith, they're there and they're cheering you on. They're rooting for you. But I'll guarantee many of you are sitting there thinking, man, if I was in the stadium, they'd be always going, boo, you stink. You're so bad at it. You messed up. What are you doing out there? And I want you, by faith, I want you to see this. We are people who encourage each other, but we are surrounded. Imagine yourself living your life surrounded by people who are cheering you on in your faith to serve your life before your living God with all your heart and soul and spirit. That's what we need to be, that's what needs to be in here in our hearts and in our minds is that we are here to encourage each other, lift one another up. Surround yourself with people of faith is as necessary for your faith as, as air is to your lungs. You cannot live without it. You need it. Verse 27, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might be disqualified. Paul does a weird thing right there, and he's talking about discipline as, as an athlete, and then he's right in the next sentence, switches over to preaching. And that, boy, this is bug theologians to no end. It's not that hard to be able to figure out, but they're like, well, that's 
even, even for Greeks, I wasn't very good Greek, but I know for some of us in here, we're thanking pastor, no offense, but when? I'm going to win? Are, are, you, are you nuts? I'm just trying to survive. Just trying to make it through the next hour. I'm trying to make it through the next day. I, you know, I've got time. Hey, I got time things going on in my head. I've got a four month deadline. I've got a 12 month deadline. I got a bunch of stuff going on in my head right now. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm just, I'm just trying to get to the, you know, I'm just trying to make it. Believe me, I know. I understand it. So did Paul. With all that he did here in Corinthians, he says, with the thousands of people that have been saved, with all the churches that I have started and established, all the lives changed by the power of God, he is struggling with the thought. He's showing you a, a struggle he's having in his heart. What if I don't win the race? Paul, the apostle, you know, the dude who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who literally gave the church foundation, boundaries, and standards, and all sorts of stuff. We needed the guy. He was a godsend, and he's sitting there going, what if I don't win the race? He obviously won. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Because remember, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. That was 10 years later. It's 10 years between Corinthians and Timothy, roughly in that time. It took him 10 years to come to the place where he says, I did run a good race. I did good. I know I'm going to make it. But here in Corinth, in Corinth and, and, and he's messing, and, and Corinth is not an easy church for him to have to pastor or discipline. He's like, I don't want to throw it all away. I don't want to blow it up. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to do these things. And even in Romans, he talks about his weaknesses as a follower the things that tripped him up the most, which was, in his case, covetousness. He wanted everybody else's bass boat. You know, he wanted everybody else's motorcycle. He wanted everybody, whatever. And and he he said that was 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 the thing that tripped him up that he would always have to struggle with. He fought, he ran, he remained. Look at that, where he says, I fought the good fight, I ran the race, I remain faithful through it all. And when you read about his life, you know, there were more challenges. He had more opportunities to say, forget you and walk off. I mean, when they're throwing rocks at you, you're not welcome. I don't know if you know that. But, you know, they're, they're, they did, when they're flogging you, beating you with a cane, that, that's not, no, that, it's like, welcome to our city. Whack. No, that's, that's not what that's about. When they got you in chains in the basement of the prison, which is also doubles as the septic tank, and you're down there singing praises to God, okay? That, that is, you know, I'm, the guy had more than enough opportunity for him to turn his back on his faith, and he never did it. He fought a good fight. He remained faithful. You may be in a place right now where it's tough and it's hard, I get that. I know it. But I want you to know that there is a win for you. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. That's a win. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good, not for disaster. I love that version. To give you a future and a hope. That's a win. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. That's a win. He will stand and be noticed before those. Winners say, I have a plan. Losers say, I've got an excuse. Winners say, let me do it for you. Losers say, that's not my job. Winners see a solution in every problem. Losers see a problem in every solution. Winners see difficult situation, but the possibility. Losers see the possible situation, but the difficulty. Losers say, oh God, look how big my problem is. Winners say, hey problem, look how big my God is. And when we come to that place where winning isn't about, it is 
Winning doesn't make the attitude. The attitude makes you a winner. Faith precedes. Well, when things straighten up, I'll have faith. Never going to straighten up. And in fact, that's such a defeatist attitude that leads you to more pain and suffering whenever you'd say that. But whenever you say, my faith is large enough to meet the need because my God is greater than anything that comes against me. He is greater than life and he's greater than death. Everything in between, he's got it covered. And I know that God is here with you today to see God through. I got to choose wisely what I do here at this particular point in time. So I was, I lost one of my guys. Um, all right, um, Greg, come on up here. Um, Andrew, I'm going to call you back. And uh, Jim, I want to borrow you. Come on up here and bring that with you. Would you please right there? Thank you so much. And I need a gold, a bronze, and a silver. Could you get that for me? So here we go. Any of us, I'm going to have you stand right there, if you would, please. Yep, thank you. Yep, right there. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Jim, come on up. The, uh, um, and, uh, but you don't need that one. You can put that one in your pocket. You're going to get a different one. Give me that. Give me that. I need a, I need a bronze. Was that a bronze? Give me my bronze. Get over here. The, uh, um, oh, All right, I want you guys to come on over here for a second. Greg, you're up there. Stand up there. And if you'll stand right next to him, right there. Okay, cool. The, uh, um, so here we have the bronze. And here, here we have the silver. Here, I'll let you put that on, sir. You're wearing glasses. That's painful. And here we have the gold. And you're too far up there to be able to do that. Uh, Three different levels. Okay? The winner, by far. That was the shortest one I had. Sorry. The, uh, and coming in a close second over here is silver. And then there's bronze. Everybody, yeah. Why is it we do that? We're like, wow, they, they, they're the gold people that, that we root them on and silver. Oh, you almost make it and good luck next time. The, uh, that's that's kind of how we see the Olympics. I get that, all right? But I don't want you to see that that way this morning. Here's the deal. They finish the race. They finish the race. They finish the race. I don't care if you come in first, second, or third. Finish the race. Go for the gold. Nothing wrong with it. Somebody's going to go for the gold. Might as well be you. You say, but if, I, but if I come in, but what if I get silver? You still finish the race. You win. What if I come in bronze? You still finish the race. You win. Do not give up. Do not quit. Do not stop. They kept the faith, a great attitudes towards God themselves and their church. They learned from their mistakes and they grew for them. They never gave up. Amen. They surrounded themselves with great leaders, great teachers, great mentors that helped them learn and discover what they would never learn upon their own. They grew from the word of God and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to be able to do his purpose and will in and through their lives to everyone that they came close to. They paid the price now for their marriage. They paid the price now for their family. They paid the price now for their faith. They made sacrifices. They gave above and beyond when what some people might even consider to be foolish or even stupid, but it was an investment into the kingdom to make sure that they finished yes. the race. Yes. Run the race in such a way as to win the prize. And let God lead you to be able to do that and give these guys a great big hand as they go back and be seated for being winners. Thank you much, gentlemen. You can keep, the, keep them. The, yeah, but that's... Uh, <laughs> winners make hard decisions that nobody else wants to make. Winners make hard decisions that nobody else wants to make. Let me say that one more time. Winners make hard decisions that nobody else wants to make. And that's what makes you a winner, to make that decision. For some of you, I've challenged you to join a hope group. You need to make that decision. I need to do that. Well, I'll come to one and I'll see how it works out. No, no, no. You never commit yourself to one. You commit yourself to a six, seven, eight, nine. 
then you'll know how it works out, okay? I commit myself to not be isolated, to let my fear separate me from my friends and family and people of faith who could encourage me. I, I, I challenge myself to sign up on version and get into a devotional and start reading the Bible. Some of you were reading the, through the Bible through with me um, every day in a year. We're over halfway. How many of you think it? There's a few times I said, praise God, we got this far. But we're going to finish, get it finished, finish well, finish strong. I know for a lot of us, if I go over the last 12 months, your life has been a roller coaster. And you're thinking, well, whenever this settles, settles down, I don't think it's going to do that. Hell thinks they're winning. Hell believes that it's going to get away with murder, literally. Hell thinks it has the advantage over us and over you. But I don't believe that for a minute because my God, the Lord of heaven's armies has declared that you will defeat the Goliaths. You will defeat your giants. You will, when you take that step of faith and say, you know what? I'm going to do that one more thing. I'm going to do the next thing. I'm going to do the right thing. I am going to go for gold. I might come in second. I might come in third. But you're going to see me run across that finish line. You will see me finish the race his glory and honor. Stand with me if you would. Father, I thank you for what you've done for your many blessings. For all, everyone here and everyone online, I thank you that we have the opportunity to be able to serve you and know you and let you move in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, I thank you for what you're about to do. Everyone's challenged. The Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to our hearts. What do you ask us to do in this moment? What is the next thing? Lord, there's so much that we have. But I thank you for what you're, what you're about to do right now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. And it's a simple question that I want to ask you that you need to say before God. Something you need to admit before God in this moment is that you've been chasing the wrong goal. You thought you, you're, you're, you were living your life for the prize, the prize. And you realize today, wrong prize. I'm on the wrong track. I'm leading the wrong life. I'm doing the wrong thing. God shapes my life. And when I put him first, he's the one that gets glory through it. He supplies my need. He gives me the skills to work my job. He provides the job that provides the pay. He gives me the knowledge to make the right decisions. He gives me peace in the middle of a nightmare. All of these things, you realize you need him. And you need to run the race in such a way as to win the prize. For him, not for yourself, not for everybody else. You're not giving up on yourself. You're not giving up on your marriage, your family, or future. You're including God in it. That's the difference. You're saying, you know what? Every one of those Olympians have coaches and you want God to be your coach. You want him to train you and lead you. And you want him to surround you with people gifted who have run the race, who have done things you're doing right now, who can show you how and the way. It makes all the difference in the world. But you realize you've been chasing the wrong goal. It's all been about you. And now you realize it needs to be more about Jesus. And if that's you here this morning and you say, Pastor, I realize I need to change tracks. I need to, I need to make this shift. I need to make that 1% effort. I need to do that one thing better. I need, I need to make that commitment to that one thing. And I need to learn how to do it and do it well. I need to make that step of faith for myself and let him change my life so that I start living my life for him. And if that's you here today, you say, yeah, pastor, that's me. I need to do this. 
You can just raise your hand, make eye contact with me. It doesn't matter. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. You can put those hands down. Is there anyone else who say, yes, that's me. Thank you. Who else? Yes, that's me. I need to do that. I need to make that step. I need to do that bit. I need to change. I need to let the Holy Spirit change me. And if you're online, give some thumbs up. Let God do that in your heart and in your life. I believe God can and will move in and through you to his glory and honor. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now in this place. Lord, look deep in our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' wonderful name. Everyone pray this prayer with me. My Father in heaven, I give everything to you. I want to finish the race. I want to finish it in a way that honors you. So I ask, speak to my heart. Speak into my life. Lead me. Help me. And encourage me to do so in your name. I want to give you glory. I want to honor you with all my life. I thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Somebody give glory to God in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless everyone here in this place as we walk out into a world that we run the race in such a way that pleases you, not everybody else. Doesn't doesn't attract our selfishness, but it instead brings out our selflessness in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you so much. You may consider yourselves dismissed.